many of you will have come across him before. Uh, before we started doing lots of online events, he traveled the world as a teacher trainer, and I've had the pleasure of working with him in many places, I've known him for so many years now. Uh, um, uh, if you have attended L Talks before, you will have uh, seen him in, in those. Uh, just in case you don't know, I will tell you that Ed Dudley is the uh, our professional development manager for Oxford University Press, where he where he works on developing the Oxford Teachers Academy courses. He has extensive experience of training, teaching, and materials writing. He's the co-author of one of my favourite books, which is Mixed Ability Teaching, which uh, which is a fabulous book if you ever uh, get the chance to get hold of it. And also the author of Etpedia Teenagers, which uh, is good. Just I prefer Mixed Ability Teaching, if, <laughs> if I'm honest. Um, so uh, he's talking to us today is reading as a non-cognitive skill so over to you Ed. Thank you Sean thanks everyone um, welcome to this talk not nitty gritty often we say let's get down to the nitty gritty but litty gritty because I'll be looking at the the topic of, of reading, reading for pleasure, extensive reading, literature and taking a, a little bit of a, of a perhaps provocative angle on this uh, it, evergreen topic of interest for teachers. I am assuming that many of the colleagues here in the room um, have, a, have a, a strong wish for their students to read more. And that's uh, an issue that I'll be addressing in this particular talk. How can we get our students to read more? The fact that reading appears to be a chore, an unpleasant task for many students, and how we can apply not only learning skills, but also non-cognitive skills to the task of getting our students to read more. There will be certain references that I'll make in this talk, and you will find them all on the handout that comes with the slides that you'll get after the talk. So uh, you should be able to find everything that I refer to. It would be great to see your comments in the chat box as we go through. And a word of advanced warning, there will be a couple of opportunities for you to take part in a poll. So get ready for that as well. Here's a little summary of what I've got planned. I'm going to begin by looking at the, the question of reading for pleasure, extensive reading, and uh, acknowledging that it can be a tiresome task, both for students and for teachers, if we're honest, and to put the question, is it worth the effort to do this in the classroom? Uh, then that should take me on to the question of the kinds of skills that are required to be successful readers, including this idea of non-cognitive skills, which I'll be explaining. And then I'll conclude with some practical ideas, approaches to use in the classroom, which I'll be happy to go into more detail about in the question and answer session that we'll have afterwards. So do keep questions coming um, and there'll be a chance to look at those uh, at the end. OK, so the first question then is, is it worth the effort? Is there value to be had from bringing extensive reading or reading to pleasure into our English language teaching classrooms, given the reluctance that many teachers find that their students have towards this topic? OK, so that's the first thing to look at. There is uh, an article on the OUP ELT Global blog by extensive reading expert Richard Day, in which, and you'll get a link to this, this uh, article later, in which he uh, lists the multiple benefits that can be had from getting students to read for pleasure. Um, I'll show you what these benefits are in just a moment, but I'd like to invite you to use the chat box here to type your suggestions for what the benefits are of getting students to read for pleasure. What do you think can be gained from this? What value is there to be had from this? Feel free to type your answers. Thank you so much. Vocabulary is a word that's coming up a lot. The word habit just caught my eye. Knowledge, creativity, achievement, discovery. I think we're all in agreement here about what these benefits are, both in terms of learning a language, but also more generally, more holistically. Some super ideas coming in. You can all see them. 
read them, and I think agree with them. I'm going to move to the next slide and let you see what Richard Day's summary is of some of the key benefits of extensive reading. Thank you so much for these ideas. So the learning skills are, are all there. Reading, vocabulary. There is also an improvement in the writing skills of students who read a lot. And also even oral fluency, believe it or not, uh, has shown to improve as a result of reading for pleasure, because of course, students very often sub-vocalize when they read, and so that actually has a direct link to speaking skills. You can also see some affective elements there. The attitudes towards English has improved. Motivation has been shown to improve as well. And, and from my own experience of reading and of being a reader, I, I would also say there's an emotional aspect to this as well. I often feel less anxious, more centered, more at ease if I'm in the habit of reading. And that is something I think which is uh, undeniable. It is, however, important to acknowledge that it isn't just a question of giving students books and saying, here you go, read away, uh, and let's wait for the benefits to improve, but for the benefits to arrive. There are certain conditions that need to be met. We have to, we have to do this in a smart way in order to reap the benefits. And in the article that you'll have a link to later, uh, Richard Day does identify four key conditions that a teacher, for example, would need to bear in mind before they uh, launched into an extensive reading initiative. Do you have any ideas about what these conditions might be? I'll give you a chance to type a few ideas before I move into um, showing you what Richard Day says. In other words, what needs to be in place in order for an extensive reading project to be successful. Okay, some good ideas coming through. And I can confirm to you that the four important conditions are here on the screen. Um, it's important to give students books to read which they can easily read. In other words, give them books which are below their language level, not above it. It should be easy to turn the page. Secondly, the more variety there is, the more likely we are to find that students are engaged. So having a classroom library of books at our disposal is certainly a good idea. Richard Day says that giving students Agency, in other words, allowing them to choose is important. And very interestingly, he also says that students should have the choice of whether to stop reading or not, which is an issue I'll be coming back to a bit later on. And in terms of the amount of reading, there is also a suggestion here that we can't expect instant results. In other words, the more students read, the better, and the element of time comes into play here as well. We need to give students enough time to develop these positive reading habits. This is great, isn't it? But the eternal evergreen problem is that very often uh, when I talk to teachers, they say, that's great, Ed, but the problem is that my students simply don't read. Let me do a little, a little question here. Do you agree with this statement on the screen? Is it also true for you that your students don't read? Or would you say that you're in the fortunate situation of having students who, uh, who, who do a lot of reading? I'll give you a moment there to respond to this, this little thought. Students just don't read. They do plenty of learning, plenty of other stuff, but as soon as they see a book, it's like Superman and Kryptonite. They, they, they turn away. Okay, I'm getting some affirming answers here. There are some people who, say, who are saying no, but by and large, people are tending to agree with this. Okay, let's, let's examine this in a little bit more detail. And I've uh, I taught for many, many years, and so have gathered my own informal evidence about this. 
And I would honestly say it's a combination of the things that you can see on the screen. Compared to other ways of engaging with language, many students just find reading is boring, frankly, and difficult. Also, they get distracted um, by various things. I don't want to point the finger at one particular thing, but um, it's quite easy for students to get distracted. It's also, I think, without practice, very difficult to maintain the kind of sustained concentration that is needed in order to read something extensively. So those attention spans in the modern world aren't calibrated to the activity of reading at length. That's something we need to be very clear about. And the one that perhaps you hadn't anticipated, but which I think is at the heart of the problem, is that students expect to enjoy what they read. They expect it to be fun, instant gratification. And we, we help them to think this by calling it reading for pleasure. And the main thesis of this talk is going to be that that isn't a helpful way to get students to read, and that we need to do something which is going to actually help them to uh, become more skilled readers, and that doesn't involve telling them they're going to enjoy it. Now, I know that might be an unexpected angle to take, but bear with me uh, and do see if you uh, can follow the, 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 the line of reasoning that I'm going to use with this. Um, what this creates for many teachers is a vicious circle of not reading. Associations with reading which are not positive, which then exacerbates the existing problem of reluctance to read. And the less people read, the less likely they are to find it interesting, engaging, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's not saying too much to, to, uh, to say that uh, many of us, teachers and students, have experienced this vicious circle and would like to find a way around it. Um, let's do that. Let's think about how we can get students to read more. Um, I'm going to offer you a strategy that I use uh, and that I think has worked well for me in the situations that I've been in. Uh, and the key, the key points are here on the screen. Uh, let's be honest and pragmatic and admit to students that probably they will not enjoy the reading that we are going to do with them. And this is not any kind of judgment about the quality of the materials we're using, right? We know how great they are. However, this is an important starting point to make. It's probably not going to be much fun when you begin. Uh, and perhaps because of that, we need to change the uh, success criteria that we have uh, in connection with reading. You see, one of the issues is that students and teachers would like uh, students and learners to read, to enjoy the activity of reading. But actually, I think what, if we're honest with ourselves, what we'd, what we'd really like is for students to read in order to read. We would like them to practice the skill of reading. We'd like them to do that more. Uh, and so it's not about reading for pleasure. It's about reading to read. And that, of course, is something which we can develop through habit formation, through developing positive habits. And this is the hardest part of all. And an approach to improving reading skills needs to be premised on this very important idea that it ain't going to be much fun when you begin. Now, why is there a picture on this screen? And who is it in the picture? This, there is a, a, clearly a, a literary connection here. Uh, and this is my reminder to myself to tell you a little anecdote connected to this idea of getting reluctant readers to read more. I have two daughters, uh, university age daughters, and a few years ago when they were teenagers, we went to the village of Haworth, which was a place where, thank you, Livia, where the Bronte sisters lived. Uh, and in the picture, you can see Charlotte Bronte. Uh, my mum took me and my two daughters to this wonderful museum in Haworth, and we went to the gift shop afterwards. My mum bought a copy of Jane Eyre. <laughs> I'll never forget this. And she gave it to my older daughter and said, this is for you. Don't read it. And my daughter, who was about 14, looked at her and said, huh? And she said, don't read it. Because when I was your age, I was forced to read Jane Eyre, and I didn't enjoy it, and I hated it, and then I never read it again. And so this 
this honest approach to the difficulty of reading planted a very interesting seed uh, that has since become a, a topic of fascination for me. Now, that message, don't read it, is saying a couple of things. It's being clear about the, the, the senselessness of having instant gratification, but it's also planting a flag about the value of reading, about the, the, the pleasure to be had in waiting for the right time to do something, to build up to it. I've got a quotation on the screen from a wonderful book by um, David Brooks called The Second Mountain, in which he talks about the impact that inspirational teachers can have on students. And he really moves strongly away from the idea of transmitting information. In other words, if we're talking about reading, it isn't a question of teaching skimming and scanning skills. That isn't the gateway to reading pleasure. The gateway to reading pleasure is giving students a sense of what is worth wanting. In other words, reading isn't just a skill, it's a value. We don't want our students simply to read more. We actually hope that they will want to become readers. And I think that is at the heart of this, pro this process of motivating students to want to read more. We're thinking not just about learning skills, which is what teachers automatically do. We're thinking instead about non-cognitive skills. And I think this is a good point for me uh, in this talk to establish what it is we mean when we talk about non-cognitive skills as opposed to cognitive skills or learning skills. So, so with your permission, I'll do that now and just spend a little bit of time comparing what we mean by cognitive skills and non-cognitive skills. So cognitive skills are typically the hard skills, the academic skills of learning. They're associated with critical thinking, being able to take revision notes, um, accurate citations and references, rational problem solving, logical argumentation. These are all the things that we typically get students to apply themselves to learn in school and academic settings, and we can measure them um, through tests, um, literacy, numeracy, and the other things that I've mentioned. Non-cognitive skills, on the other hand, could be called life skills, or if you prefer, global skills, and they're more associated with things that you can't learn from a book. They're attitudinal, they're connected to behaviors and the strategies that we need in the classroom, but also in life. We see this in how people bounce back from disappointment, how they build harmonious relationships with their classmates and with their teachers, um, how they manage their time, how they regulate their behavior with the emotional ups and downs that are part and parcel of the learning experience, um, and how they collaborate successfully with others. All of these things, I think, are much more important when it comes to developing a reading habit than the cognitive skills. I expect and hope a little bit of pushback on this, but um, I'm, I'm deliberately being a little bit provocative here with my thesis, so hear me out. Okay, let's have a, uh, a little scenario here for us to look at, and this is going to be a chance for you to take an active part in this session. We're gonna have a little poll here based on a an imaginary situation. Let's say that you look at the weather forecast for tomorrow, wherever you live, and it says rain. There are four options for what you can do on the screen here. Which one would you prefer? Do you want A, to ignore it, in which case you get soaked? Do you want to escape it by getting away? Do you want to rage about it, which would probably give you an ulcer? Or do you want to accept it and get an umbrella? You can use the, the polling option, which you can see on your screen, to click the option that you prefer. And as our moderator, Datsa, has said, please use the poll to, to answer, not your chat. Thank you so much for giving us the results here. It seems to be a no-brainer, right? We all, we all kind of get the inherent common sense of accepting it, 
and getting an umbrella. It seems to me, though, uh, if I remove the, I think I can remove that from the slide. It seems to me, though, that very often when it comes to reading, students expect the sun to shine as soon as they open the covers of the book. And then when it starts to rain, they immediately become disheartened. I think that we need to tell students that reading is a bit like a rainy day, that you need to accept the fact that it's a suboptimal experience at first, and accepting that will actually help you to get more out of it. It'll give you an umbrella of sorts. What I'm doing here is challenging the expectations that students have when it comes to reading. We basically have expectations for reading which are too high. Reading for pleasure is a promise that we often can't deliver on. And I think adjusting our expectations of reading is more likely to lead us to success. I'm sounding here uh, perhaps a little bit like a stoic philosopher. <laughs> and speaking of stoicism, um, there was an idea among Stoic philosophers that the anger and frustration which we experience on a daily basis are caused by having expectations which are too high. Ever been stuck in traffic in rush hour? Get frustrated? Okay, that is an, an example of having expectations which are too high. There's a wonderful book by Alain de Botton called The Consolations of Philosophy. It's on the handout in which he says, we will cease to be so angry once we cease to be so hopeful. We will cease to be so angry once we cease to be so hopeful. In other words, it's going to rain. It's going to rain as soon as we start working with extensive reading in the classroom. It isn't reading for pleasure. It's a chore. But I would say that there are huge benefits to be had by approaching reading as a chore. Bear with me. Bear with me. Think about the following. Think about your own life and the attitude that you have to the household chores that you have to undertake on a daily basis. You don't want to do them, but they're necessary. And there are immediate positive consequences of doing them. If you have teenage children or relatives and you ask them to do the washing up, they, 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 will, they will argue differently. However, we understand that over time, when we develop a habit of, get, of doing the washing up every day, once we've you know, finished a meal, we can enjoy the positive consequences of having done them. The enjoyment comes not through the activity itself, but in the achievement of the goal that we've set ourselves. We don't expect to enjoy it, but we do enjoy the fact that it's nice and clean. It's nice and tidy. We've finished. And here's the real game changer. People who do their chores regularly become good at them. They can do them faster than people who don't do them regularly, and they can do them better in a short period of time. I think the same, the same argument applies to reading in the classroom. The more we do it, the more skilled we become at it, the more we get out of it, and the less of a headache it becomes, provided we've been able to build this positive habit. The danger, of course, is that we won't get students doing it for long enough in order for them to reap these benefits. And perhaps that's because we keep telling them it'll be enjoyable when the truth is it isn't. So this is something that, that I think is, is, is definitely worth communicating to students. Okay, what about yourselves as readers? Now I have quite a, an, I have a, a, an audience here of language teachers who I presume are language lovers and who I presume fell in love with the English language partly because of a love of reading. So I'm pretty safe in my assumption that you guys uh, enjoy reading and like, like to read. And I would like to examine, I'm going to give you a, a little survey now, and I'd like you not to think about your students. I'd like you to think about yourselves, yourselves as, as language users, and also actually how you read, uh, not only in English, but in any other languages that you speak. I'm going to ask you four questions. You can't see the questions because I'm going to dictate them. And I just want you to type in the, the answers that you would like 
to give to the questions that I, that I ask you. Okay, so question number one. Um, when in your life did you spend the most time reading? When in your life, how old were you when you spent the most time reading? Just type, you can type the number of your age at the time. And again, in any language at all, in your first language, in your preferred language. Okay, 12, 16, 25, I've got a 30 there. University age. Most of the answers I can see are, you know, early childhood. I think the majority of answers are under 25. I've got 148 there, which is uh, an exceptional answer in that it's not typical. But I think we can agree here that the, most people are looking back in time to a time when they were uh, in full-time education, maybe, or younger. Okay, question two. Question two. Did you read more when you were 18 years old, or do you read more now? Did you read more when you were 18, or do you read more now? So for question two, just write 18 or now. And I can see that lots of nows are coming up, which is brilliant to see, but also a fair few 18s. I'm inclined to say it's 50-50. Okay, here's question three. Um, what's, what's different if you, and, and in particular, if you, if you said that you read more when you were 18, what's different now? What's different now? What, what, what accounts for the difference in the amount that you used to read compared to the amount that you read now? Okay, the important thing here is to, to notice the difference and to think about what's changed rather than to justify it or explain it. No, no right or wrong answers here. Already from the comments that have come into the chat box, what I can see is that time is the issue here. I think that this is something which uh, I was right to predict would be an issue. Question four is a, is a simple yes, no question. Um, and it's this, in an ideal world, in an ideal world, would you like to read more than you do right now? In an ideal world, yes or no, would you like to read more than you do at the moment if you had no chores to do and no homework to mark and no lessons to plan, et cetera, no family to look after? Yes or no, would you like to read more? Okay, the answers here are <laughs> overwhelmingly affirming of this as being a good idea. Okay, thank you so much for those interesting answers. Right, don't, and by the way, don't feel bad about not reading as much as you'd like to. It is an entirely unrealistic thing to be able to, you know, um, stop, stop the wheels of life to read. Um, there is, however, a chance to make certain decisions or certain recalibrations that will allow you to, 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 to change the path slightly in the direction of more reading, if that's something you'd like to do. And I, I'll be coming on to that in, in just a moment. Okay, I have a, I have a, a second part to this survey. which I'm going to show you. Um, I, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask Sean to help me out here. We had this last time. What can you see on the screen, Sean? What does the slide say? It's on the reading survey still, part one. Listen part to one, the questions. okay, great. Yeah, now it's on part two. Scenario. Thank you, great. Here's part two. So this is, this is a, a poll question. Again, don't use the chat box. Wait for the options to come up. There is one correct answer. This is not subjective, okay? This is, this is uh, a question I want you to, to give your full thought to. Try to find the correct answer. There's only one correct answer, in my opinion. You're reading a book, okay? And after about 20 pages, you realize that you're just not enjoying it. What do you do? Do you stop reading it and start a new book? Do you think, okay, this is the wrong time. I'll come back to it later, maybe next month or maybe next year. 
Or do you say, I've started, so I'll finish, and you read it right through to the end? You need to click the answer that you agree with and then click Submit. Thank you for voting. Remember to use the on-screen poll, not the, um, not the chat box. Okay, the answers are in, and the answers are still coming in. I'll give you a moment to, to think about this. Uh, in the question and answer section at the end, I'm happy to talk some more about this, but my thesis of this talk is that there is one correct answer only, and the correct answer is C. If you start to read a book, and it's a really terrible book, you should read it through to the end anyway. <laughs> that was the least popular option in the room. Only 20% of people said that. So 80% of you uh, object to that answer. So I was, I, I anticipated this. <laughs> and so I, I have, um, I have some justifications for why I believe that you should, we should finish the books that we start. Okay. First of all, let's acknowledge that there are difficulties involved in, um, reading a book right through to the end. And I think that many of us have experienced them. It simply isn't enjoyable. Why am I reading this book if it isn't enjoyable? I'm tired because you have so much going on in your life. By the time you pick up a book, your eyelids are drooping. Thirdly, there are distractions. And again, there are all kinds of things that distract us. I'm not pointing the finger at any one cause. And as many of you have said already, there simply isn't enough time in the day. Okay. But you know what? You should still read every book you finish right through to the end. And I'll tell you how these four difficulties can be um, managed before I talk some more about why this is a valuable approach to take. Okay, so the solutions I would say are the following. Remember, we don't, you didn't say you wanted to enjoy reading more, you said you wanted to read more. So don't read to enjoy, just read to read. The activity of reading a bad book is still reading and you can become present and aware of the fact that you're spending time in your own company in a quiet and comfortable place reading. And that is something that you've always wanted to do. So feel good about doing it. Why does the book have to be enjoyable on top of that? Isn't that asking for too much? Secondly, the building up of resilience and positive habits is something that we can apply to that tiredness. Just, just five more pages, or maybe just five more minutes if we're especially tired. That helps us to kind of work out. And the parallels here with a gym session or working out, I think are self-evident. The, the distraction, well, that's a much harder one to solve. If it is that you're looking at your phone when you should be looking at the page, put the phone somewhere else. I confess that I have no solution to children uh, saying, you know, come and do this for me, come and help me with this. That's the kind of distraction that uh, you can't, um, you can't magic away. And the fourth one is one that I do have a solution for. If you find that the issue is that you don't have enough time in your day for reading, then I don't think it's a question of tacking on extra time. I think it's a question of replacing one activity uh, with another. In my own case, I went through a period of my life when I watched a lot of a lot of soccer matches on TV, and I didn't read as much as I do now. I now I would say I spend the time I used to spend watching football, reading, and that was some, something had to give there. And in your own cases, you know that's a decision that's worth making consciously about what you can give up or do away with in order to find that time to read. Now these. These skills that you can see of these solutions, they do not involve skimming or scanning or predicting or checking or remembering words. They aren't learning skills. They're not cognitive skills, are they? They're non-cognitive skills. They're to do with the attitudes that we bring towards our goals, and they're connected with ideas like resilience and grit. Now, resilience and grit are key words in the approach to um, non-cognitive skills associated with uh, educational psychology. 
I'm going to talk a little bit more about th this kind of grittiness just now. But I, I'm aware that I've probably surprised some people with my idea here of finishing books to the to the end once you start them. I'll be more than happy to talk a little bit more about, about that in the Q&A session. So do please feel free to push back on that. But what was I talking about? Resilience and grit. So resilience and grit are these non-cognitive skills that it's easy to develop through reading for all of the reasons that you yourself have just confirmed in the surveys that we did. These aren't things you learn from a book. They're things you learn from developing these positive habits. We can learn them. Um, we definitely can develop them, but it's tough to do that. And there's no guarantee in the classroom that it's going to work. So again, this is something where we aren't teaching reading skills. We're establishing values. In other words, we're giving students information about what's worth wanting in life. I, I want to be a reader. You know, I want to read Jane Eyre one day. I want to come back to this beautiful place. I want to go to a library. These are values rather than skills. And I think an approach to teaching, which is likely to end up to culminate in successful reading, will focus on these non-cognitive skills rather than the cognitive ones. What's deliberate practice? Okay, Deliberate practice is working on things that aren't going well working on weaknesses. If a student is picking up a book and finding it difficult, then that's deliberate practice opportunity. And it's simply a question, as we'll see in the third part of this talk, about how we structure that in the classroom. Um, all of these things, all of these non-cognitive skills are achievable by all because they're not connected to talent, they're connected to the effort that we bring to the endeavor that we are involved in. Angela Duckworth is the author of Grit. There will be a, um, a link to that or a, a citation of that on, the, on the, the handout slide that you'll get. And her Grit formula uh, indicates a, and there's some research behind this that indicates a, a, a journey of achievement that begins with some, some talent or interest culminates in achievement. There is an important way stage of skill when you, when, when halfway through this journey from initial talent to achievement, there is the acquisition of some kind of, of, of a specific skill. But there's a multiplier here in each case. In other words, what is it that turns talent into skill? And, and what is it that turns that same skill into achievement? What's the missing word behind the question mark? What's this magic multiplier that's so central to the grit formula? Have a guess if you if you wish in the chat area before I before I reveal. Yeah, there are the answers that I'm looking for are in the chat box plus synonyms thereof. Basically effort is this magic multiplier that helps us go from an initial interest or or talent to this full full scale full scale achievement we need to work hard it's like doing a chore it isn't going to be fun necessarily but that still means we need to be very careful about how we do it i'm going to move on in the last part of this talk before we get on to questions to think about how we can do this in the classroom um, but to kind of summarize the key points that I've said so far, before we start thinking about techniques and things like that, again, I would say one of the key things to take away is that what I haven't talked about in this, in this talk is reading skills. I haven't talked about the cognitive skills, the micro skills of reading. Instead, I'm talking about the importance of shaping students' attitudes towards reading, giving them information about what is worth wanting, what is worth valuing. And another thing that I've been guilty of in the past is of overloading students, overdoing it. Um, and I want to make an analogy here about teaching someone how to swim. I want to use a swimming pool analogy. You could say that one approach to, to reading would be to throw students in at the deep end. Well, we know from experience that's un unwise. If you throw somebody in at the deep end, they just swim to the edge and get out or 
presuming they can swim, but they, they, they don't enjoy the experience. They want to get out. I think it's important to start in the shallow end, and the same applies to the approach to reading. I'll be showing you some what I call shallow end tasks for reading. And the aim of these tasks is not enjoyment. The aim is perseverance. I'd like my students to get through the 10 minutes or the 15 minutes or whatever it is and have the success that comes from task achievement, not the enjoyment that comes from the reading itself. We're in the shallow end of the pool. And I think the only way that we can have success is if students find their own way to the deep end. I can't throw them there myself. I get them in the shallow end. And then some students, not all, will find their own way to that deep end. So that's the, that's the philosophy, if you like, behind the approach to reading in the English classroom that I think needs to accompany the otherwise excellent ideas we have about you know, using graded readers uh, and other approaches in the classroom to promote extensive reading. Okay, so I would say that if we want to use these non-cognitive skills to develop reading, remember the attitudinal behavioral skills that all students can develop, that it would uh, look like some, it would look something like this, um, five important aspects of, 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 of this, this plan. The first thing is to do with time, that we need to find time for reading in class. I think very often there is a tendency for teachers to give reading tasks as homework, right? It, it makes it seems more efficient to do it that way. Let's do it, do it for um, do it for homework. Um, whereas if we don't ever do reading tasks in the classroom, students are likely to come to the conclusion that it can't be very important or valuable because we never do it in class. Um, if we begin a reading activity in class, if we have moments of quiet when everyone's reading that actually I believe leads to more success afterwards. People are much more likely to read at home or outside of class if they began reading together with everybody else in the lesson. I have a real life example of how this works for me in my own life. Uh, I go to the library uh, where I live all the time and I borrow books from the library. Here's the way I do it. I find a book I want to borrow I take it off the shelf and then I sit down in a chair in the library and I read it for 15 minutes in the library and then I borrow it and take it home. When I do that, I get home and can't wait to get back into it. Whereas if I just dive into the library, grab a book and run out, sometimes, I'm sure you know where I'm, I'm going with this, sometimes that book just gets put on a shelf and you kind of forget about it. So that's why it's important to read in class. Secondly, let's have time as an important parameter here for reading. Let's think of the gym session parallel here. The new success criterion that I would suggest would be getting through a 10 minute segment of reading. You don't have to finish it. You don't have to you know, read the whole thing. Just read for 10 minutes without doing anything else. That in itself can be incredibly difficult for students at first. Thirdly, joint hardship, a phrase um, coined by Dernier and, and Murphy, is this idea of an unpleasant task done together by students at the same time as a way of promoting team spirit and resilience in, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that, that is quite obvious to anyone who's ever been in the classroom. When students are doing something unpleasant together, there's a kind of fellowship or companionship that emerges from the shared experience of the unpleasant task. If you ask students to go home and do unpleasant tasks on their own, it's much more resentment, much less task achievement uh, than if it's done together. So that's an interesting counterintuitive way that we can get this working in our favor. Routines are part and parcel of the development of any non-cognitive skill, including reading. And lastly, I think that it's the job here of the teacher to set an example as a, a patron or a promoter of books and reading. Have books in your lesson. Hold books in your class. Refer to them as you teach, not because you want students to read them, but because you want students to value what it's like to be a reader. In other words, the takeaway, as David Brooks said, is not information, but the, the, the wanting to become something, that planting of that seed or inspiring 
uh, students to do something down the line, reading Jane Eyre, but not yet, but wanting to read it. Okay, let me let me show you before we before we uh, get on to the question and answer two broad approaches that I like to take to reading tasks in the classroom for developing these non-cognitive skills. And they can be classified, I think, into two broad categories, the D-E-A-R category, DEAR, and the magnet and hook category. Okay, D-E-A-R, if you, if you Google or if you put into a search engine, you know, reading, classroom reading, D-E-A-R, you'll see what it is. Uh, but can you guess? I'm sure that some of you have, have come across this approach before. It's an it actually has been used as classroom initiatives here in the UK for reading. Any ideas what D-E-A-R is about? Thank you, Sharka. Drop everything and read. This is a regular classroom routine where the teacher will find a certain period of time in which students get out their books and read. No comprehension activities, no monitoring, no tasks. Just read. Put everything else away and read. The article that I uh, read suggested 20 minutes, but honestly, in an ELT class, I think 10 minutes uh, is 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 an ideal amount of time to try and read for not necessarily every lesson but on a on a regular basis okay and and the the three kind of immediate applications I would say for this i won 't talk about them in much detail now, but if you would like to know more about them in the q and a I can say some more about them have have a library visit actually take your students to the nearest library, whether it 's a physical library or perhaps in class on an online library. plant that seed. Have a library in your class that students can borrow from, and this builds the joint hardship as, as well. Uh, sometimes the limited variety of books mean that students are all reading the same books after a period of time. That can lead to activities like post-it reviews, where students read a book and then write their comments or ideas about it inside the book. So when another student takes it, they have a little comment written by a classmate. That can be uh, an example of joint hardship in action. We're all in the same boat together. The second type of activity or approach to activities is this magnet and hook. And if I was to paraphrase this, I would say these are general language practice activities on the topic of reading. So they're about books, but they don't involve reading them. That's the brilliant thing. You're simply giving students an idea of something that's worth wanting. You can get covers of books, perhaps different editions, and ask students to say which one they prefer. Um, you can do uh, a foreign language cover. For example, in the top right-hand corner of the slide, you have a book by Stephen King. But do you know what the book is? Arroyogash is not an English title. This is a translation of Stephen King's book into another language. So you could try and do an information gap activity where students try to guess which book it was. You know, there are obvious world famous titles and authors um, which you could use um, for this kind of thing. And again, the students think they'll have to then go and read the books. Uh -uh. It's simply a way of generating language practice on the topic of books and reading. And if you were looking for, um, and by the way, to Devaki, it is The Shining. Well done. Any Hungarians here or Hungarian speakers will be able to confirm that. And if you're looking at first line tasks for writing, very often a lovely task that really energizes students and gets them curious is to show them the cover of a book they haven't read, for example, The Shining, and try to get them to write what they think the first sentence of that book could be. Never uh, do they have to, uh, they don't have to read anything of the book, but the gloriously um, satisfying and counterintuitive result of doing this is very often students then become curious about that book. And I would say, teacher, can I, can I just see that book again? Or do you want to dip into it, which is music to our ears? Um, as, I, as I reach the, the segue from the end of the presentation part to questions, I just want to kind of recap what we've done. We've looked at the value of extensive reading, the important language learning benefits of getting students reading for pleasure. And all I've done while wholeheartedly supporting that initiative, 
all I've done is to, I think, make the very important point that we shouldn't be calling it reading for pleasure because it's actually reading as a chore. And I've tried, I hope, to show how that approach, a more pragmatic and realistic approach, can lead to uh, not only classroom success, but I hope lifelong success as readers. There are mm, materials from Oxford University Press. I've referenced the OUP ELT Global blog. I also want to draw your attention to OUP's focus paper on using graded readers um, by uh, Nick Bullard, this, which you have access to. Uh, and there are also, uh, there's a, I mentioned the Richard Day article. There's also, I think, a link to an article by Bill Bowler, uh, an extensive reading expert. Uh, and, and uh, prolific writer of uh, extensive reading materials who has five golden rules for extensive reading as well. So whatever your own philosophy or approach, there are things to look up and look out for. I'm happy now to see if there are any questions. I'd be happy to go into more detail about the things that I have uh, skimmed over. And I'm kind of bracing myself here for a bit of pushback on my contention that if you start a book, you should finish it. So I'll stop talking here for a moment, have a glass of water, and uh, see if Sean has any questions for, for me. There are, there are already quite a lot of questions. I'm not sure how many of them push back uh, against you, although I'd like to push back about reading a book to the end at some point. Um, so on the Q&A, if you click on the Q&A tab when you're ready, okay. the, the, there are a, a number there. Uh, if you need any help, just let me know. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, Judith's question, if material is below students' level, isn't it boring for them? Probably not. If the material is boring for them, that's probably more to do with the topic than the, uh, the cognitive challenge. Um, boredom comes from lack of interest. Difficulty is connected to cognitive challenge. So I love reading children's books. I love reading things which are way below my own reading level, uh, provided that the topic is interesting enough. And that's, I think, something which is definitely worth providing. Richard Day's, one of his conditions was having variety. So not just a whole bunch of, uh, of books on the same topic. Uh, okay, Lucy has a question. One of my students is very talented. She loves reading in her first language, but refuses English books. She's used to reading fast, specific topics. It's difficult to meet her criteria. Uh, is there anything I can do? Yes, applaud and encourage her to read as much as possible. Reading as a value is what we are looking for here. This is the fuel that we need to have on the stove. If a student is reading in the first language, don't discourage them. Encourage them to read as much as possible. Skilled readers in the first language will become skilled readers in the second language. Lucy, I think you have a very pleasant uh, dilemma there. And I think that that is something that we should always try to encourage. Okay, um, let's take a look at Paulus's question. Would providing relevant text to discuss useful or boring books for teenagers, would, it, would that be, for example, once identified a trend of using social media, then provide a text about using social media with a purpose for students to encourage reading habit as well as using social media wisely? Yeah, I can, I can see that that might be uh, an example of a reading activity. It does strike me as being something which is much more focused and targeted than I would normally expect extensive reading to be. Um, I imagine here that there is a, a desired or expected outcome to this kind of activity, whereas the key feature of extensive reading is that you're reading to read rather than reading to tick any particular learning box. Okay. Um, I'm scrolling here through. Let's have one from Nadia. Don't you think that one of the major reasons for not reading is the topics themselves? Uh, frankly, no. I think that there we can read about anything under the sun and that there is always going to be a chance for a student to 
um, be given uh, or to find a topic that suits them. But I actually believe that the search, the mad search to find the right topic misses the important point that you become a skilled reader, not by skipping skillfully from favorite topic to favorite topic, but by slogging through things that you're not enjoying. That's when you build the resilience and grit that helps you to read something skillfully. I'd like to give a, a personal and quite pertinent example today. Today saw the sad death of Hilary Mantel, the brilliant author and writer of the Wolf Hall trilogy. And I was just thinking when I saw this sad news about the first time I tried to read Wolf Hall, which you may or may know, might not know, um, is set in Henrician England and centers on the life and career of Thomas Cromwell, advisor to Henry VIII. The first time I tried to read this book in 2009, when it came out, I was, let's just say, watching more football than reading books. And I discovered within about 50 pages that I just wasn't enjoying it. The, there, were too, there were too many characters. There were like five char pages full of the characters' names at the start, and there seemed to be seven different Thomases in the book. I gave up. I, I stopped reading it. And you know what? I didn't, I didn't flip to another book straight away. I just kind of thought, well, well, this wasn't very nice. And I, again, weeks passed before I picked up another book. Um, the third book of the trilogy... Um, is it The Mirror and the Lights or something like that? The third one, I read that when it came out a couple of years ago and skipped all the way through it without any problems at all, just remembering what it had been like the first time I read it. I genuinely believe that if somebody were to pick up Wolf Hall for the first time, they would experience what I experienced. It's a boring topic. It's old fashioned. It's not enjoyable. That isn't necessarily a reflection of the topic being the cause. It's proof that unless we've developed the positive habit of reading, we are not going to find it something which is easy. In fact, we'll find it almost impossibly difficult. So those of you who do want to read more and are looking for a wonderfully informative and engaging series of novels, if you haven't read Hilary Mantel's Wolf Hall trilogy, uh, dip into that. But here's a word of warning. Don't expect to enjoy it uh, if you, if you uh, are reading it for the first time. That, I think, is part of the, uh, the, the skill of this entire approach. Um, I'm going to see, Sean, do we have any more time for... Yeah, questions? you've got about five, you've got about five minutes. Okay, um, okay. Uh, thank you so much for all the questions that are coming in. Um, Sharon has a great question, it's right at the bottom of the, of the list there. What are your views on reading aloud during class time? Don't do it, is my view. Uh, especially in the context of reading uh, extensively. Uh, reading aloud is, for all kinds of reasons, an extraordinarily traumatic thing for students to do. I'm sure that many people here in this webinar have awful memories of being asked to read aloud in class when they were students. And also there's the bizarre phenomenon that when you're, when you're reading out loud, you can't actually process very well what you're reading. You're simply focused on articulating the words correctly. Um, so I don't really see the value of that. I imagine that perhaps you're thinking of small groups or pairs or, or doing something where what's read out links to something. I'm not sure, but as a general rule, um, if we're just reading something and a drop everything and read and one person is reading out loud, uh-uh, that's not, I think, uh, uh, an approach that I would value or would expect to lead to particularly uh, positive results. Um, okay, a question here about from Shiva Kumar, how to address heterogeneous classrooms, so mixed levels, mixed interests, mixed abilities. Um, I think here to answer your question, um, the answer is to provide the variety and to provide the choice that Richard Day suggests in his article. There's no need for everyone to be reading the same text at the same time. Um, that's really the, the teacher's job is to encourage trial and error, to make sure that uh, there is there is enough variety for students to learn um, what kind of things work for them and which ones don't. Um, Teresa L has a good question about how to help students reflect after reading. And I would answer that question about in, in the following way. Um, it's really useful to think about what you didn't like about a book. And was it, and to think, okay, was it the topic? 
was it the writer's style? Was it the language level? Was it the length of the book? Or was it just something like the size of the text or the font? Whatever it is, become aware of that. That then helps you make a, a better choice the next time. And this is a nice point for me to come back to the, the, the thesis about always finishing the books you read. When I read bad books, and it does happen to me occasionally, um, I'll give you an example. The Promise, which won the Booker Prize last year, I hated it, but I read it all the way through. When I read a book like that that I don't like, I'm then much more careful about deciding what to read next. And I think that's a wonderful learning opportunity when students are standing in front of library shelves, poring over the different options and thinking to themselves, you know what? I have to make a good choice here because if I choose a, a book that's a real turkey, I'm going to have an unpleasant experience reading it through to the end. Having the discipline to read right to the end, even if you aren't enjoying it, builds that resilience, and it also makes you much better at spotting the kinds of books that you think you are more likely to enjoy. You probably have time for one more question, Ed. Let's have one more question. Um, okay, I'm going to finish with Yash uh, Joshua Banter. What I did today in the class is I took the students to the library. Wonderful and suggested them to read some stories from Aesop's Fables, super selection there, to encourage them to read so that they will develop the habit of reading, which will help in developing other skills as well. Is that right, Joshua Banta? That is a wonderful uh, conclusion to this webinar. That is exactly the kind of thing that we can do. Uh, take them to the library. That's a value, not a skill. It's a place that we want them to come back to in their lives. Provide them with encouragement, not, in, not forcing or insisting, and giving them that selection. And you've said the key word here of positive habit formation. And we're speaking here, uh, I know that habit and language learning is very often kind of controversial, but not, I think, if we're talking about non-cognitive skills rather than cognitive skills. You can only develop a non-cognitive skill through the formation of positive habits. Thank you to Joshua Banta for that wonderful um, closing comment. Thank you to everyone for your comments and questions. Um, and thanks, Sean, for, for your, your capable moderating. Go well. Go well. There's a there's a, a phrase that I uh, that I like. I, I, I'm just wondering. I, I said he obviously builds resi resilience, but um, you, you seem if you if you read um, Wolf Hall before you read The Promise, then then um, you were still choosing bad books. <laughs> Sorry, don't want to be a pedant there. Um, it, it, I, it, I find it really interesting because I'm actually not in ELT, but I'm struggling with my, we're not struggling, but my, my son, he's quite young, he's a reader, and he will give up mm. if he doesn't like uh, a, a book. And I, I'm trying to be processing whether it's better to kind of, during your talk, whether it's better to kind of push him on mm. or, uh, with that. Because I understand, I completely get what you're saying. Yeah. But at the same time, I wonder how much, you know, like when you're trying to motivate a young reader in that sense. Yeah. It's, it's it's, again, the age is an, is, is an issue. I can see the younger the reader, the lower the bar needs to be. Yeah, yeah. But the temptation always, and I think we all find this when we when we think, ah, oh, this is awful. I'm gonna just gonna stop reading this. The temptation is that the next book will be better. Whereas the truth is, if we aren't in the habit of reading a lot, you know what? The next book's gonna be awkward and difficult for any number of reasons, or potentially. So that's why I stick doggedly to the philosophy. Of oh, no, I I'm, I'm, I'm not a great fiction reader. I, I read a lot of non fiction mm. books, and I completely see what you're saying. I see it in myself that one of the reasons I'm not a non fiction reader is because I've got into this vicious circle. I, I start a book and think, oh, I don't like it. And, 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 I, and I completely see what you're saying yeah. uh, with that. But I did, but there's obviously an age difference there. You know, think about myself. Yeah. But really, it's really interesting because I'm just all the way through it. I was just reflecting on myself and on what my reading habits were and, and what you were saying it affected me, never mind any learners that I'd had. So, so thank you very thank much. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, yeah. everyone.